Hello and welcome to our talk on the paper Fault Attacks on CCA Secure Lattice Camps. My name is Peter Pestel and this paper was joint work with Lukas Bokop. So you're probably well aware that NIST is currently running a, a standardization process for post-quantum cryptography. This standardization process is currently in the third and kind of final round. And amongst the finalists are three lattice-based key encapsulation mechanisms, CAMs, namely Kyber, Andrew, and Saber. And NIST is expected to pick one of these three for standardization by the end of this year. Uh, so these three finalists are kind of a nice fit for resource-constrained con resource embedded devices. They have a quite a, a good runtime. Uh, but the problem is, of course, performance isn't everything because uh, embedded devices are put somewhere in the field. They are accessible to attackers and thus uh, susceptible to implementation attacks. So what's the status of implementation attacks on these uh, lattice-based CAMs? Well, for side-channel attacks, there is already some stuff known, some stuff published. So we have seen various attacks and also some first protected in terms of masked implementations available. Now, uh, the situation for fault attacks is quite a bit different. There is very little published work on fault attacks on lattice-based camps, and also hardly any public information on how to achieve protections against potential fault attacks. And since NIST is expected to pick uh, a scheme for standardization quite soon, uh, this is something we have to look into. Now, what's also interesting about these lattice-based CAMs is that some of them share quite a lot of similarities, as, as least uh, if uh, viewed from a high level. For instance, uh, Kyber and Saber can be seen as descendants of a scheme by Lubashevsky, Pikert, and Rosen, the LPR encryption scheme. So this is a CPA secure public key encryption scheme based on uh, where the security is based on the ring learning with error problem. So uh, this scheme is only so this LPR scheme and its descendants are only CPA secure and to get a CCA secure uh, key encapsulation mechanism both Kyber and Saber employ some variant of the Fujisaki Okamoto transform and what this transform essentially does is during decapsulation you take the ciphertext you decrypt the ciphertext to get some message M then you re-encrypt the ciphertext uh, using uh, randomness that is a, uh, deterministically derived. And then you check if this re-encrypted ciphertext matches the received ciphertext. And only if these two ciphertexts match, then you release the true shared secret K. And otherwise, if they don't match, then you assume that the ciphertext was manipulated that you received in some form. Uh, and then you return, for instance, a random shared secret or an error signal or something like that. Now, uh, we've uh, seen s s uh, constructions like that somewhere different as well, because what this is, decrypt, encrypt, and check, uh, if the same comes out again, this is essentially also a fault countermeasure that we often use in uh, symmetric key cryptography, for instance. We decrypt, encrypt, and check if we get the same input again. So the question is, can we still uh, do attacks on, on such schemes, even with this kind of inherent fault protection in place? And the answer, as you may have guessed from the title of the talk, is yes, because we sh show that attacks are still possible and practical. So the, uh, this Fujisaki Okamoto transform is a fault deterrent. It makes, might make faults harder, but is not a countermeasure as such. Uh, our attack works as follows. So we uh, introduce a fault at a specific spot. Then we observe, does the decapsulation fail or does it still return the correct value? So this is kind of like a safe error attack. Uh, the, the outcome, so the information, does it fail or not, uh, carries information on the private key. We gather this information over many invocations, over many faulted decapsulations, and we finally solve for the key. Uh, we uh, attack Kyber and New Hope, so two schemes. 
uh, and we have to fault at least 6,500 decapsulations. But we also uh, say that, there's a, that there is a high probability that uh, such attacks can also be extended to other similar schemes. So to explain how this attack works, I have to give a brief introduction to LPR. Uh, so this LPR encryption scheme, I always like to call it, describe it as a noisy Elgamar scheme. Uh, so this works as follows. Uh, it uses, it works with elements in a polynomial ring RQ, where all coefficients are taken uh, modulo some uh, Q. Can be a prime, but doesn't have to be a prime number. Uh, key generation works as follows. First, two polynomials S and E are sampled, where all coefficients follow a, a, a narrow error distribution, chi. For instance, Kyber uses a binomial distribution between, for instance, minus 2 and plus 2. Then a second polynomial A is sampled, where the uh, coefficients are drawn uniformly from set Q, and the public key B is computed as A times S plus E. For encryption, you uh, uh, again sample three polynomials from this error distribution. So you sample R, E1, and E2. Then you compute the two ciphertext components, U and V, and uh, you encode, you add the, the message onto the sec second ciphertext component, V, uh, by encoding it. And you can do this, for instance, by uh, taking each message bit as one coefficient and multiplying this bit with q half so you either add zero for a zero bit or q half for a one bit and for decryption you compute m m prime equals uh, v minus u times the secret key s and this works because if you do back substitution you get that this m prime is m times q over two so the encoded message plus r times e minus e1 s plus e2 so plus an additional error term but all these uh, polynomials of, involved in this error term are sampled from this small error distribution. So we can say that M prime is approximately M times Q half. And this might look something like in the, in the figure below, where we show an exemplary uh, distribution of all the coefficients in this M prime. So we have two uh, kind of Gaussians, not truly Gaussians, but kind of. Uh, and we have one such uh, peak, uh, one such Gaussian centered around uh, zero. So these are all the zero bits and one distribution centered around Q half. So these are all the one bits. And these, these distributions are far enough apart such that a decoder uh, can then work out if a, a noisy bit belong is actually a zero bit or a one bit. And this scheme or a, a variant of this scheme can then be uh, plugged into this FO transform to get a chosen ciphertext secure key encapsulation mechanism. Where again, there is the question, where can we now inject a fault so that we can actually attack this? Uh, some people have already suggested to attack uh, this final equality check, so to check if two ciphertexts are uh, identical. Uh, and to, check, uh, to fold the, it in such a way that always you get the one path off of this, this multiplexer. Uh, this would then re-enable chosen ciphertext attacks. But again, uh, this is already known. And also this uh, comparison is often quite a small part of, of the runtime. So you can throw lots of countermeasures at it uh, and it, it won't make a lot of a dent. Now, faulting in these three middle components also doesn't uh, help us a lot because if we assume that the attacker generated the ciphertext, meaning that he runs, honestly runs encapsulation, then he already knows all the values that are processed in these three boxes because this is essentially just encapsulation again. The re encryption, it, it uses the exact uh, same values. And of course, uh, faulting a known value doesn't really help us a lot. So finally, uh, we can uh, fault the decryption, which is also kind of uh, the, the, the most uh, uh, logically real part because it involves the secret key. The problem is 
in fault attacks, we often think of it in a way that, okay, we inject a fault and we get some disturbed result and we use this disturbed result to compute backwards and derive information on the key. Here, however, we have the problem, if we inject a fault such that this M, this uh, message is changed, then uh, of course the re-encryption will lead to a different ciphertext and meaning that uh, always we have always re will always return a random shared secret and there's of course no information on the secret key on some in some random value so we have to do it think of it a little bit differently uh, because if we think about it the only recoverable information really that we get is is this the secret key correct so did uh, we follow this one path in this multiplexer are both ciphertexts the same or is it some random so were the two ciphertexts differently and this information this distinction correct k versus a random k has to carry some information on the key now where can we inject the fault such that we have a chance to still get the correct key so it is still the same M and that it uh, also carries information on the key. Well, we found a place in the decoder. Uh, remember that this decoder recovers the message M from this noisy M prime for each coefficient. It takes input values between zero and Q and it outputs a single bit, zero or one. So even if we shoot in there randomly, then we have a 50% chance to get the same bit out of it but of course we can't do it randomly we have to do it uh, a little bit cle uh, more cleverly so we use the assumption that the attacker runs the encapsulation in an honest manner and he sends the ciphertext meaning that he knows the shared secret and all intermediates that are computed during encapsulation and also during re-encryption now, if we have a look at this equation, which turned up during uh, decryption, m prime equals m times q half plus re minus e1s plus e2. Now, a lot of these uh, 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 terms that are in there uh, are known to the attacker, namely the message r, e1, and e2. And only two polynomials in there, e and s, are unknown, and this is the secret key. So this means if we learn some information on this M prime, uh, apart from the fact if it decodes to a zero or a one, then we have information that is linear in the secret key. Okay, but how can we uh, learn something about this M prime using a, a uh, fault? Well, for that, we have to look at the decoder, how it is actually implemented. And for this, we use the reference implementation of Kyber's decoder. It works as follows. It takes an input A uh, between zero and Q. It multiplies this input by two. So this is just a scaling of the axis. Then it adds Q over two. So this is just a, a shift of the axis. It divides by Q uh, the value. So this, and then uh, the uh, least significant bit is returned. This is this AND with the constant one. And if you follow the distributions here, so the solid lines belong to a bit zero and the dashed lines to a bit one. And you can clearly see that uh, all bits are correctly uh, decoded. But what happens if we skip this one step, this addition with Q over two? Well, now we have the following situation that for the, the positive part of this error distributions of this kind of Gaussians, uh, these are still correctly uh, decoded because if you have a look at the green solid line, it still decodes to a one, the green dash uh, to a zero, the green dash line decodes to a one, but the negative parts the, uh, they, on the left of the, of the distribution, they are incorrectly decoded. So a, a one gets decoded to a zero and a, a zero gets decoded to a one. And this also means that uh, if we uh, decode to a correct value uh, to a, an incorrect value, then of course the re-encryption will say, yeah, this this ciphertext was incorrect, and will reject, and we will get a a random uh, shared secret. So we can say that this error term, this re minus e1s plus e2, 
the and the if coefficient. So this is the coefficient where where we injected the fault. We can say that this linear equation uh, is larger or equal to zero if the fault, which we call ineffective, so which means that we injected the fault, but we still get the correct k out of it. And on the other hand, we can say that this linear equation is, is, is negative if the fault was effective, meaning that we, we injected the fault and it really changed something up and the incorrect bit was returned and and since uh, the fo uh, uh, detects that something is incorrect we get a random shared secret k so uh, we now gather such so what we have now is an inequality so on the left we have some some uh, something which is linear in the key and then we get is this larger than or equal to zero or smaller than zero so a linear inequality so we now gather many such inequalities and we get uh, one inequality per faulted decapsulation. So we generate many ciphertexts, we send it to the device, inject one fault per uh, call, and we get one inequality out of it. Uh, and we gather these inequalities in, in some manner, and we can actually write these inequalities in a matrix vector form. So we uh, exploit this, this, so we use this, this linear property that this is linear. So we write E times S as uh, on, in this vector, and uh, the known coefficients, this R1 and E1 in the left matrix and then we have instead of equals we have uh, this uh, this vector which contains smaller or greater than and now uh, this problem here of recovering e and s using this this left matrix and this right vector with the e2s in it well if you replace this vector with the un with the unequal signs with the larger and smaller signs with approximate signs then this is essentially a linear decoding problem that uh, that where we already have uh, several algorithms to to tackle such decoding algorithms, uh, and we uh, and for this reason we use a, a technique that is also known from decoding. Uh, we use uh, belief propagation. I'll, I'll skip over all the many details which are uh, involved in this kind of decoding process. So uh, we co decode this code and we find E and S. Uh, we attacked this implementation for Kyber and New Hope. So this shows that uh, this attack works for uh, multiple schemes. And we also attacked a masked decoder implementation. So of course, masking as such is not a faulting countermeasure, but more a side channel countermeasure. But still, since uh, our uh, this attack is implementation specific and we skip over an instruction, it, it uh, we had a look if, if attacks still work. Uh, we uh, determined the, the success rate of the, of the attacks via simulations. So we uh, determined the success rate as a function of faulted, of the number of faulted decapsulation. And of course, for, uh, and you can see the outcome below. So of course, for uh, larger, more secure parameter sets, we need more faults for Kyber. And for the smallest parameter set, Kyber 512, we need a, 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 about 6,000 uh, faults. And for the largest parameter set, we need like 13,000 faults to get a good success rate. But to show that uh, this attack is also really practical, we actually ran this attack. So we, we ran Kyber 512 on a microcontroller, uh, injected clock glitches in this microcontroller, and we uh, successfully recovered the, the the key on this microcontroller. So, okay, uh, in conclusion, what we have here, we demonstrated that attacks even on uh, FO transformed key encapsulation mechanisms are practical. So the Fujisaki Okamoto transform might be a fault deterrent. It makes attacks harder, but attacks are still possible. Uh, 
we uh, applied this attack on Kyber and New Hope, but uh, similar attacks for other schemes likely exist. So for, for schemes that are very uh, similar in their, uh, from a high level viewpoint, so the, which are descendants of LPR and uh, use an F, a variant of the FO transform. Also, I'd like to highlight that what I described here is a very specific instance of this attack. So we have to skip this one very specific instruction, but it's very likely that attacks uh, also work on other positions. So using other, uh, skipping over other instructions or using a, 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 a bit flip somewhere or a, a data corruption instead of a skip or whatever. So so this, this this just means that uh, it it doesn't suffice it won't suffice to to protect this one uh, uh, specific instruction. So uh, to conclude, finally uh, we put all our code online. You can have a look at the uh, the the attack code, uh, run uh, the simulations yourself and have a look if you're interested. So this is then the end of my uh, talk. Uh, thank you for uh, your interest.